Section one. In this section, you will hear a conversation between two students about the installation of a telephone. You have half a minute to read the questions first. Now listen to the conversation carefully and answer questions one to ten. I buy a new telephone. You read the instructions, and I will install it. Right? Sure. First, push the battery door outward to open, and then insert two batteries, size AAA. Make sure they are following the polarity directions indicated inside the battery compartment. Finally, close the battery door. This is the first step. Now let's come to the second step: adjusting time. Press time key first, then press M R C key more than one second to enter the time adjusting state. Have you seen the second digit flashing now? Yes, it is flashing now. So let's go on. Press M R C key again to adjust minute, hour, date. Have you finished? Yes, all the digits have been flashing successively. Now it comes to adjusting alarm. Press alarm key to enter the three states of A1, A2, A3. Pay attention to the two keys in the corner on the right hand. They are the keys to lock and unlock the alarm, respectively. Press M R C key to enter the adjusting procedure. And have you seen the second digit begin to flash? Yes, I think I should repeat this action. Yes. Yes. Press M R C key again to adjust minute. And the on-off of the alarm. By now, you own a phone at the same time with a clock that can wake you up in the early morning. That's the end of section one. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Section two. You will soon hear an informative talk given by Michelle on how to keep out burglars and keep your home safe. Before you listen, you have a chance to read questions eleven to sixteen. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions eleven to sixteen. Keep 'em out. There's no fail-proof way to keep out a burglar, but every little bit of deterrence helps. Even if you can't afford a security system, you can take a few minutes to make your home a little safer. Some relatively simple steps will greatly decrease the odds of a break-in. Which means you can enjoy a bit more peace of mind, and isn't that what home is all about? Think like a burglar. If you were one, how would you get into your home? Evaluate your home from the inside and out, night and day. You might even try a mock break-in, trying window jams and loose locks on your house's perimeter. To keep out a burglar, the first thing to do is to secure the windows. Though windows are relatively easy to break, the loud noise of shattering glass will deter a thief if you're near other houses. Don't leave windows open during the night, whether you're at home or away. That's a common sense precaution, but a surprising number of people forget to do just that. Use a pick-proof locking device for your windows. Make sure the frames are solid. If you're beyond the earshot of your neighbours, they won't hear the glass breaking. 
Consider installing a plexiglass sheet for the more accessible windows. This will make entry through them more difficult. Your doors should also be secured. If you don't have a peephole, install one in the front door. If you have one, make sure that you and your family are in the habit of using it. Don't open the door to anyone you don't know, especially at night. If the peephole is out of reach of your children, keep a stepladder or stepping box by the door for them to use. If there's any glass within two feet of your front door lock, consider a locking device that would be out of reach if the glass is broken. Now, a few tips on how to protect your valuables. Don't leave your valuables, stereo, computer, jewellery, etc., where they can be seen from the window. If you don't want to hide everything from sight, consider blinds. Make a valuables inventory. Keep a record of your expensive and personally significant items, not just a listing, but a photographic or videotape record if possible. Store this inventory at another location. This is helpful for both the police and the insurance agency to identify the stolen goods. Use an engraving pen to mark these items with some kind of personal identifying information, such as your initials, in an inconspicuous place. This also helps record your possessions in case of any other mishap, such as fire or flood. Now look at questions 17 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. Don't stop your security awareness at the outside walls of your house. Your yard areas, if any, also deserve your attention. In general, don't leave anything around the yard that might help a burglar get into your house. Ladders, stackable boxes or any garden tools should be put away, preferably in a locked cabinet. Install a light in your yard that is sensitive to movement. Place it high and out of reach. Trim hedges or bushes that are near doors or windows. These can be good hiding places. Don't place outdoor furniture tables nearby the house. These could become an easy stepladder to the roof. When you are on vacation, create the occupancy illusion. Maybe you laughed at your mother for leaving the lights on and the radio playing while she left for vacation, but she had the right idea. Those steps aren't quite enough, so try these strategies. Buy electronic timers that turn lights on and off at different times. Hook up a timer to your TV for a few hours each evening. Turn up the volume too. Not enough to annoy the neighbours, just enough that a lurker at the windowsill couldn't miss hearing it. Have your newspaper and mail delivery suspended. If you don't have time to do this, ask a neighbour to pick them up for you. Ask a neighbour to park in your driveway or parking place. Think about having someone house-sit your home. If it's a relative or friend, it may cost you no more than the contents of your refrigerator. You can also find professional house sitters or house sitting services that find someone to stay while you're away. Leave your shades as they are normally, or at least don't close up everyone. One sign of a vacant house is closed shades during the day. Lock your garage door with a padlock. That is the end of section two. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear a conversation between Helen and her tutor. 
First, you have some time to read questions 21 to 30. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 21 to 30. Come in. Ah, it's you, Helen. What can I do for you? Well, it's about that essay on non-verbal communication. I'd like a bit of advice, if that's all right. By all means. That's what I'm here for. How can I help you? Um, it's about that survey you asked us to carry out about body language. Oh, yes. I asked you to investigate what sort of touching is permissible between friends of the same sex and friends of the opposite sex. That's it. And then you wanted us to go on to compare the answers we obtained from people from our own culture with the answers of people from other cultures. Well, that shouldn't be too difficult. There are students here from dozens of cultures, including Asia and the Middle East. Go and ask them. That's the problem. I'm not sure how to word the questions. I think I've got far too many. People don't want to be bothered answering them all. Is that the list of questions you have with you? Let's have a look. Hmm, I see. Your basic idea is fine. You've got a checklist of the parts of the body we mostly use to touch people with and a checklist of the parts of other people's bodies that we usually touch. But you don't have to go right through the list asking a separate question about each item. You can make your questionnaire much shorter if you ask open questions. Open questions? What are they? Sometimes we call them WH questions. What, when, where. Those are examples. Oh, I see. Yes. We learned about them in grammar. I hadn't realised how useful they turn out to be. I could just ask one open question about each subject and tick the answers I receive. That's right. Now, let's have a look at the list of parts of the body you're going to ask about. Um, I see. You've got the head, arm and hand, and, oh, it's over the page, the back, leg and foot. What about the shoulder and the thigh? They're important areas, and there are some others you should include too. Oh, yes, of course. I was in a rush and forgot those. Um... What about asking people how they feel about being touched? Surely, it's hard for people to put that sort of feeling into words. Yes, you're right. That's why it's essential to work out a rating scale for each response. Can you tell me a bit about how to use rating scales? Well, there's no way to measure how strongly a person feels about something, of course. All we can go on is what they report about their feelings. So what we do is offering them choices of ways to express how they feel. Very strongly, strongly, or not at all. That would be an example of a rating scale. In this case, as your survey is only a small trial sample, I suggest you use that three-point rating scale I've just described. Very strongly, strongly, or not at all. That'll be enough to enable you to draw some broad conclusions. You may go on to refine your survey later if you decide to specialise in the study of non-verbal aspects of behaviour. Thank you. I'm much clearer now. Could I ask you one last question? I'm afraid I've got a brain like a sieve, but I just can't remember the technical term you told us for the study of touch. It sounded like happy, but of course it isn't. Oh, you mean haptics. H-A-P-T-I-C-S. Of course, haptics. That's it. Happy to be of service. That is the end of section three. You will have half a minute to check your answers.
Section four. In this section, you will hear a report about crime and punishment in the UK. First, read questions thirty-one to forty. Listen to the report and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Like many other countries, Britain has experienced a great increase in criminal activity of nearly every kind. Nearly five times as many acts of violence were reported to the police in 1997 as twenty years before. Although most burglars are not caught, those who are caught overload the courts and prisons. Although The courts try, in theory at least, to use probation, community service, and other devices to avoid sentencing people to prison. The fifty thousand people in prison are more in proportion to the population than in any other Western European countries. Vast sums are being spent on building new prisons, but the prisons are still overcrowded, and the humiliation suffered by their inmates. Makes rehabilitation difficult. Many prisoners are released early on parole. The prisons in England are run by the Home Office, though each prison has a local board of visitors, who make reports about conditions and also deal with serious bad behaviour. Normally, prisoners are released after serving two thirds or less of the time for which they were sentenced, but an offence in prison may be punished by the loss of some days of remission. There are several kinds of prisons, including open ones, and some prisoners go out to work in groups outside. Prisoners who want to study for examinations are helped to do so, and there are training courses in prisons. But in practice, some spend little time outside their cells. Most crime is committed by young males, and is opportunist and is not planned by hardened professional criminals. Although these do exist in most common people's view, crime tends to be concentrated in large cities and urban areas. About 94% of offences recorded by the police in England and Wales are directed against property, but only 5% involve violence. Rising affluence has provided more opportunities for casual property crime. In 1977, for example, car crime was only one tenth. Of total crime, but this has risen to about 28 percent. The demand for and supply of illegal drugs had been an increasing factor in the incidence of crime in recent years. Regular crime surveys are undertaken in England and Wales, Scotland, and in Northern Ireland. In 1999, a survey in England and Wales asked respondents for information about how crime had affected them in 1998. It estimated a total of 15 million crimes in 1998, the majority of which were against property. Violent crime accounted for only 5% of the total, while 36% involved vehicles, 9% were burglaries, and 30% other forms of theft. These surveys, the fifth of which is in progress, indicate that many crimes go unrecorded by the police. Mainly because not all victims report them. That is the end of section four. You will have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of practice test one.